let me just briefly review what we did in the last class. <coughs> so remember, our goal now is to prove the Jordan decomposition of a matrix, right? So we want to prove that we can write a matrix A as V a bidiagonal matrix times V inverse, where in the bidiagonal matrix, the super diagonal ones with zeros on it. Can this call the Jordan decomposition? Right, remember the goal of this is to try to understand what a to the power of n looks like, right? Because if you look at if, if this is called j, this matrix over here is called j, then a to the power of n will be a v j to the power of n v inverse, right? So we will simplify the calculation, right? And once we can simplify this calculation, that any polynomial in a can be computed by <coughs> just applying the polynomial to j. Okay, so, so it has a lot of applications, but this includes the matrix exponential, the matrix inverse, the log, or the matrix, and so on and so forth. And all of these are used ex extensively in engineering. Right, so we have to study these, <laughs> this expression, which means you have to study this decomposition first. So on a side note, this is not the only way to write this decomposition. So the Jordan decomposition, you know, is very popular. But there's also another way to write this decomposition, which is sometimes a little bit more use, uh, easy to use in real life, but it's very rarely taught. It's called the way of one. Okay. It's not very taught, but there is a book actually on this now. So if you're interested, you can also look at this. For some calculation, it's actually much, a little bit easy to use that way of writing this, this decomposition. In this class, I won't talk about it. These two decompositions are equivalent. If you know one, you can write the other one. Okay, but historically, for some reason, this one became dominant in people's minds, so that one is not as used anymore. Okay. <clears throat> now, so the way we approach this was, right, is by looking at this decomposition and noticing that whatever numbers that are on this diagonal, so if you look at the diagonal of this matrix, look at J, it's got some numbers on it, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, like that, and then 1s and zeros on the top. Now, the key observation we first made is that if you know the lambdas that go on the diagonal, then the rest of the calculation should just fall apart, right? And what we observed is that these numbers are such that if you look at A minus lambda i, you can always write that as also V J minus lambda i V inverse. So the, what is nice about these lambdas is that if you subtract lambda i, one of these diagonals from the NP, then there will be a zero on this matrix on the diagonal somewhere, and that matrix will become singular. We won't know what the null space dimension is, but it will be singular, okay? So let's just, I want to emphasize this point because this point is why this calculation is so hard. If I give you, if I look at J minus a lambda 3i, like that, right? I will get some number here, some number as zero on the third position for sure, then some numbers, if any, may not be zero, and then ones and zeros like that. Right, so this is an upper triangular matrix, right? So you can even pretend that there are some numbers up there, it doesn't make a difference. So there's one zero on the diagonal. So we know for a fact this matrix is not invertible. Right, and I ask you to write down at least one vector in the null space of this matrix. You should now ask yourself the next question. If I just know how many zeros are there on the matrix, or even if I just know there's one zero on the diagonal of this matrix, can you find the dimensionality of the null space? Okay, this is a very important question. Okay, you should be able to answer this, think about it for yourself, and come to conclusion one way or the other. Okay, can you ask, can you tell me just by looking at this structure, what is the dimensionality of the null space of this matrix? Okay, if, if you do everything correctly, you'll see that this is not obvious at all. You can't say it's the null space dimension is the number of zeros in the diagonal, for example. Alright, so you should think about this very, very carefully. Okay, so you think about it, make sure you understand how you'd go about trying to compute this number. Okay, much of the difficulty in proving the joint decomposition has to do with this question over here. And maybe in the way I do it, I'll sort of mask this question in my proof, but in Karl Mayer's proof, this is the question you have to actually answer first. Okay? So, so take your time and try to do this, right? This is already in upper triangular form, but it's not in an in, in LU factor form. It's not the U is not in the right form. It's not, in row, it's not even row ready circular form. Okay? So you still have to do some work and you have to figure out what is that work you have to do and then can you estimate this dimensionality. Okay, the answer should be pretty much, the answer should come out to be no. Okay, it's very hard to say what the dimensionality that is going to be without knowing something more about that matrix. Okay, so I'd be able to write on a few examples based on the Jordan form 
to come up with some examples that might help you answer this question. All right, so we'll set that aside. So the key thing is to find the eigenvalue. And we know that these eigenvalues will make this matrix singular, which also poses this matrix to be singular too. Right, so the lambdas are the numbers that you subtract from the diagonal of the matrix to make it singular. And use, based on this, we found at least one lambda, right, using polynomials such that AV was equal to lambda V. Lambda V and lambda V was equal to 2 normal V is equal to 1. So, right, so we found this by finding a linear combination of the powers of A that goes to 0 because, you know, if you look at the powers of A, they lie in an n squared dimensional space. We take n squared plus one of them. Then some non trivial linear combination should go to 0. That gives us a polynomial. We find roots of those polynomials, and one of those roots will actually make you satisfy this equation, right? So there's this long slog we did. But not surprisingly, we're talking about polynomials anyway. All right. So once we got there, from here, we said, well, from this, now we can, by talking about 2 by 2 matrices, we can prove the show decomposition. We said, okay, now I can find all of these lambdas, and the show decomposition says that you can find a unitary matrix Q and upper triangular matrix R, such that all the numbers lambda that can make A minus lambda singular will appear on the diagonal of this R matrix. So you find all parts of the lambda, there's no more left in this world. But given matrix A, the sheet of says all the numbers lambda that have the property, if you subtract them from the diagonal matrix A, it will become singular. So there can be at most n of them, and they'll all show up on the diagonal of this R matrix. Right? Now, from there we want to go to the Jordan form, right? But the key thing is that the Jordan form is almost a linear problem after this. Okay, so let's look at it. So when we try to find the Jordan decomposition, we're given a matrix A, say 2, 3, 4, 5, so on this side, right? We need to find these four numbers, numbers on this diagonal, right? So there are something, something, something here. This is my J, and then this Z inverse. Right, those are the numbers we have to find. But if I tell you what the numbers are on this part of the J matrix, if I tell you what these numbers are, so if I tell you the eigenvalues, right, then the problem is almost done. Why? Because you see that, well, look, I don't know what these numbers are, but either a 1 or a 0, so I can always try both. Right? So there are really two things to try. Right? So if sort of you know J, it could be one of two things in this case, so if I know the two eigenvalues. So if I take this V to this side, and I call this matrix A, I'll have A V minus V J is equal to 0 to solve. Right? But this is a familiar equation. You've seen it two or three times in your homework now. So you know the matrix A, you know the matrix J, right? And you have to find V. It's a linear problem, right? You can do it by gas elimination. So what is the difficulty now, right? So why is the proof going to take two or three more lectures to finish? Well, part of the problem is that when you did this homework, you probably noticed that when you solve this equation from, for a given A and J, it was already very hard to solve it when A and J were both upper triangular. Here, J is upper triangular, but A is not upper triangular, right? So we could use a Schwer decomposition to make this into R, but still there's some difficulty. Second thing is that the case I gave you in the homework only talked about the case when this matrix was actually invertible, this linear operator, so there was a uh, non-zero right-hand side, and then I asked you the unique solution. But this is exactly the opposite of that, okay? We are saying, I'm picking J in such a way that this has a, has a lot of solutions. So find one for which V, this matrix V is, not really exists and non-zero, but actually invertible, right? So it is quite difficult. There's a non-linear constraint on this matrix V. It turns out the way we choose the matrix J, this linear equation has a lot of solutions, capital V. So if you go into R n cross n, where this, all these matrices lie, then we know that this solution V it's, a, it's in the null space of this operator, right? So this is the null space of the operator L of A comma J, right? So L of A comma J maps B to this matrix. So there's this big null space on which this matrix B lies. There are lots of solutions over there, right? But our requirement is that you must pick this matrix B such that the V inverse exists, right? So you might think, oh, this is such an easy problem, right? Because we know that if I take a matrix V that is not invertible and I add a small perturbation to it, I can always make it invertible. We can take an arbitrary small perturbation, right? When we just single values, we saw that. We just make all the zero single values into small, tiny, non-zero numbers, and the will become invertible. Right? So for a given matrix V, if it's not invertible, you can add a very, very, very tiny perturbation, small as you want, 
So I said immediately becomes invertible. So you say, oh, if, if I pick a solution over here, then somewhere nearby there is a, an invertible V. The problem is that you cannot prove that that invertible V will lie on this line. So that's like a simple example, right? Suppose I say the set of solutions of this equation is any middle of the form lambda 0, 0, 0, for example. Or even mu, they put. Then you see that no matter how I pick lambda and mu, right, this is a linear subspace of Rn cross n of R2 cross 2. Right, it's the span of this, it is the span of these two matrices. So it's a linear subspace. Right, you can see that no matter how big lambda and mu, this maze is not going to become invertible because these zeros there are fixed. Right, so you, you can end up with a, a vector space in Rn cross n in which none of the matrices in that vector space, in that subspace, are invertible. Right, so it's, it's not trivial to say that, okay, I'll find all solutions by Gaussian combination and then I'll somehow easily find a V that is invertible. Okay, so that part, the last part, is a bit tricky. Okay, but it's not that hard either, okay? So, mostly it's just Gaussian nation. We have this operator, right? I just make a wild guess at this J, once I know the eigenvalues. I know almost everything about this equation. I just need to solve for V and find, there are many, many solutions. I just need to find a V that is invertible, okay? So, it's mostly Gaussian nation with a little bit of trickery thrown in to make my V invertible. All right. But getting the Gaussian machine to go right is a difficult part, okay? Because in, along the way, we must construct this V such that it becomes a linearly independent columns, okay? And that's what we're going to try and do now, okay? Just one long Gaussian machine, keeping in mind that this V must come out to be invertible. Okay, so in preparation for this, we might be able to solve the part that I ignored in the homework. If I give a Sylvester equation like this, right? I give it an A and I give it a J, and I tell you that this has a null space, find all solutions of this guy. So this part must be doable. Right, they're exactly the part that I, I ignored in the homework. In fact, we look at exactly the opposite of that. All right, so, so this is going to be hard. If it was easier, we're just giving it to you as a homework problem. So it, it requires a little bit of finesse to do this part of the calculation. Okay, so we're going to try to do it. So in preparation for this hard calculation, we're going to try to make this matrix A look as pretty as possible. What are the matrix A is this the matrix R? So from the Jordan form. So in the Jordan form, when we started, we had a matrix R that looked like this. So the first thing we did is to sort these eigenvalues, right? So we said, okay, find me a permutation to other unitary transformations such that when I finish applying them, this matrix, the eigenvalues over here are sorted, okay? So all the lambda ones come, then all the lambda twos come, and all the lambda threes come, right? And there's some stuff still left up over here. And lambda i in this notation is not equal to lambda k. Right, so first thing we do is get all the eigenvalues that are equal to each other numerically as complex numbers into con into contiguous blocks on the diagonal bar. Okay, so without this extra effort, you'll see that computing the null space of this many becomes extremely hard to do. Right, so this goes back to the first equation. If I said that I have an upper triangular matrix in which I have zeros like that, and I ask you to find a dimensionality of the null space of many, it's hard to do. It's a little bit easier to do if I can keep the zeros tight up against each other like that, okay? The calculation will become easy and we'll see this as we go along. All right, so okay, so in preparation of that, we said we are, we are first going to sort the eigenvalues so that all the equal guys come together. Okay, the next thing we're going to show now is that with one step of gas elimination, we can introduce zeros in the off diagonal box. Okay, so this is the next part we're going to do. Okay, we can, I'm going to show that if I take a matrix R that looks like this, okay, then I can find a matrix W, Inverse. So let's just say there are three blocks in this R. Lambda ones are here. Lambda twos are here. Lambda threes are here. And then I have stuff all the stuff up here, up here, up here. Then these are all zero blocks. I can find a invertible transformation W. So that if I use a similarity transformation on this matrix, then I can clear out all the off diagonal blocks over here. So I, I still have lambda ones here. I have lambda 2's over here, I have lambda 3's over here, but all these blocks will also become zero. Okay, so I'll get a block diagonal matrix after this process. Okay, and we can do this just by purely by gas information. Okay, so we're going to look at this now, and so just your homework problem. So we're going to just go back to, to our old homework problem. Okay, so let's see how do you do this. Okay, so let's just give everything names first, so it's easy to do this. Okay, so I'm going to name this matrix, so let's say that 
let's call this upper block over here as R11. Okay, this is R12, R13, okay, R22, R23, and R33. Okay, that's my box. What is, of course, this notation is ignoring is the fact that the eigenvalues here, so the, the numbers on the diagonal of this upper term are not the same as the numbers on these two. Okay, so we'll just write that down. So we'll say that R i i is lambda i. Uh, this has lambda i's on its diagonal. And some numbers up there. Okay, so the diagonal blocks have constant main diagonals. The odd diagonal, of course, is not constant; just whatever numbers you feel like. And we're saying that lambda i is not equal to lambda j. Right, so we've got the distinct eigenvalues in the different blocks. Okay, you notice that when we talk about something like two complex numbers not being the same, of course, then in numerical calculations and floating point arithmetic in MATLAB, there's a vacuous thing. Okay, you can never, of course, do these things in MATLAB. Okay, this is just a pure theoretical construction I had that we're doing right now. So be careful about this. Okay, there's no, there's, there's no computation to be done over here in real life. Okay, all you know is that if you run into a case in real life where two eigenvalues are sitting close to each other on the complex plane, then you probably are in trouble. All right, because then you don't know whether what the actual Jordan form is going to be, and this will have a huge impact on the actual transients. All right, so we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later again. So, so, so when we so this is the situation, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to in the proof that I'm going to do for this theorem, I'm going to do it in the two by two case. Okay, so the proof will be just like the standard. We'll do the two by two case and then finish the proof by induction. Okay, for this two by two case, I'm going to call this entire block as one block now. Okay, so I'm going to write this as, so let's put hats over here because I'm going to rename these guys. Okay, so I'm going to re-block it, call the, this block is still called R11. Okay, this block is going to be called R12, these two together, and this entire block of here is going to be called R22. All right, so with this, notice that I still satisfy my requirement that the numbers on this diagonal are different from the numbers on this diagonal, okay? So this is an upper triangular matrix, this is upper triangular. The numbers here are lambda 1s. The numbers here are either lambda 2 or lambda 3. But these numbers are distinct from those numbers up there, okay? So that is still true, all right? All right, so now I just need to show, okay, with one set of gas information, I can eliminate this, so. So what is, the, what is the goal now? So for, so for the induction step, I want to show that if I start with this matrix, I apply something here and it's inverse over here, I want to end up with a matrix that looks like, say, R11 hat, a 0, a 0, and R22 hat. All right, so this is what I want to do. I want to kill the off diagonal block by simple similarity transformation. Right? And then you can finish the proof by induction on this block. All right? So this is the only step that I will actually do. All right. So remember, the key thing is that both of these, must, this matrix, what do I put here? I must put its inverse over there. Okay? So that's the only part that makes this data a little bit tricky. Okay? So we'll just stare at it. Okay? So obviously, we have to guess a little bit here, okay? Because, you know, we have WA and W inverse, right? So this matrix thing looks horrible. And if I take one of them to the other side, then I don't know what these numbers are either. Right? So I will get a nonlinear problem one way or the other. So a little bit of guessing is required before we plunge into the problem. So how do we guess? We notice that we start with upper triangular and we sort of end with upper triangular too. Right? So we know the products of upper triangular matrix of uh, upper triangular. So our first guess would be that if I would, if I guess this matrix is upper triangular, then we know the inverse of an upper triangular matrix is also upper triangular. Right? So at least I will get this 0 for free then. Right? Because there are three upper triangular matrices multiplying, I should get upper triangular matrix again. So this part will be for free, no matter how I pick the numbers in this upper triangular matrix. Right? So that removes half the equations from us. But we have two constraints to satisfy. We want to make this 0 and that 0, right? We don't care what these numbers are. Right? So this way, we're picking this to be upper triangular, we get rid of half the equation. So we're still left only with the equation on the top. Okay, so let's see what you do over there. Right? So we could, in the beginning, guess that, oh, I should put A, B, C, and then I should put over here the inverse of that. It could be A inverse minus A inverse C, B inverse, sorry, B, C inverse, C inverse. We could go like this. 
But if you write this out a little bit, you'll see that actually you don't need three sets of unknowns, A, B, and C, three subspecies of unknowns. It's enough to pick A and C to be identity matrix, and you can still finagle a solution out of this one. Okay, so you can still so you pick A and C to be un, to be identity, then you see that you end up with minus B over here and identity. Right? So we'll put a question mark now. Okay, so that's our guess. Okay, that's our answer. We're going to start the solution process of so whittling down many of the unknowns to be just be zeros and ones. Okay, of course, if I fail, then I go back and I'll see up some more parameters up there, looking for a solution. All right. So this is this is my answer. Okay, this is my guess that this is going to work, and I could be, of course, completely wrong about this. Right. So now that I'm still here, we can now multiply the left-hand side and see what I get. Notice this is just Gauss elimination because these are just elementary Gauss transforms, right? For example, if I multiply by the matrix on the left. It, if I multiply by this matrix on the left, let's call this X to match the notes that I had, okay? Then this is multiplying the last row by capital X and adding it to the first row, right? That's gas emission we're going from top to bottom, from bottom to top. If I look at this, this is multiplying the first column by minus X and adding it to the second column, okay? So gas emission on the columns. So you see both have to be done because it's a similarity transformation. What do I do to the rows? I'm going to do the opposite of that in some sense, from the right-hand side to the columns. Okay, so if I apply W on the left, I must apply W inverse on the right. All right, so the Gaussian elimination, the inverse, of course, is to just add rather than multiply. subtract. Okay, so we proceed. So if I multiply, if I multiply this, if I apply the first operation, I get R11, R12 plus X times R22. Right, you'll be careful that you're multiplying from the left, and then I have to multiply by i minus x zero i. The first column will come through unscathed again. The second column will be r12 plus x times r22 minus r11x, and this will come out as r22. All right, and the question is, can we make this into star zero zero star or not? Okay, the stars mean I don't care what numbers you put there, as long as you end up producing zero on the top right. Right, so we see that, well, if you look at this equation, then we have no choice in the start. This will come out to be R11 and R22, so those two blocks will come through unscathed, right? So they will just be what they were originally. The only way I can satisfy, the only thing that has to be satisfied is that I make this top right block the same as well, right? The other three blocks are going to be the same on the left and right now. So we see that the only equation that we have to satisfy is this one, is R12 is equal to R11X minus X R22. Right, I carry the question mark. Right, which is of course the same equation that you had in your homework. Right, the Sylvester equation. And you notice that it is an essential calculation after you know the eigenvalues. To separate out the two blocks and the two different eigenvalues from each other. Okay, in other words, it's the essential calculation for computing the invariance of space of both the eigen set of eigenvalues. You cannot avoid it. Okay, so this is one way to motivate the Sylvester equation. There's another way where you look at the whole thing geometrically. Okay, if you can view the whole factorization process as like a, something sitting on a manifold and talk about Lie algebras and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's, you can show that what we're trying to do is actually compute the tangent of some manifold and that for those kind of computations you end up with the Sylvester operation. Again, as long as the manifolds are uh, is in a matrix space. Okay, so there's a more differential geometric explanation of this. Okay, so this operator will show up incessantly. You can also show this operator will show up by another scheme by talking about polynomials. So maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, but this guy is important, okay? So this kind of equation you'll see again and again. is one of the few such matrix operator equations that you can actually solve well by hand by using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so it's good to know it. If I added one more term, for example, if I say, okay, there's a matrix A, X, B over here, where A and B are known, then nothing is known about the linear operator. Right? It seemed like you know, I, I barely made a change. If I'm talking about a sol sol solution of this, I can say a lot. Okay, I can show it depends upon the eigenvalues of R11 and R22. If I lift my hand and say I have one more term that look exactly the same as the previous two, then nothing is known. Okay, in fact, it's an open question even to estimate the norm of the linear operator. These are called elementary operators. They do occur in PDEs, 
right? And they're the root cause of difficult algebra later on in real life, right? In real life, you have 3D, and you end up with this more than this. When you talk about PDs, like Maxwell's equation and obvious stocks, you end up familiar with that. There's one reason why those problems are so much harder to solve, and which are so rarely now taught to undergraduate because of that. Okay, but when you don't have that, you're talking about ODEs, then you end up with this guy instead. It's much simpler to solve. So good to know that, right? Good to know which mathematical equations are easy to solve, which ones are hard to solve. So this one is easy to solve. So it's easy to solve. They can say, when does this have a solution? So you all done this before, so I will just uh, pick one method to do this. One method, of course, is to just convert this into a giant equation where we put the columns of x here. We put all the numbers from R11, R22 here. We put all the numbers from R12 over here, and give you guys information on this guy. Right? And of course, you should all make sure that that brute force approach is always lying on the table, right? If something goes wrong, that's the thing you're going to do. If you did the brute force approach and were very, very careful on how you ordered the rows in the column, you will see that if you do this, you'll end up with a polynomial in R11 and R2 in value factorization. So you'll be back to eigenvalues eventually. Okay, but I'm not going to take that approach, but you should just try it by hand. Right? So we won't take that approach. What we're going to do is we're going to guess the case. A clever way to do this by exploiting the fact that both R11 and R22 are actually upward from the matrix. Okay? So we just exploit that. We notice that if I multiply both ends of the equation by, let's say which one do want to multiply, by the first column's identity, then, so this is going to exploit the upper triangle nature of this matrix, and we see that on the left hand side, of course, we get whatever is on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we get R11 times the first column of x. And here we get minus x times R22, one one entry of R22 times the first column of x again. And therefore, we can write this as R11 minus R22, first entry of x of R22 times identity times the first column of x. Right? This x times E1 is just the first column of x. Right, so the, you can easily solve this for the first column of x because this whole thing is an upper triangular matrix. Right, R11 is upper triangular, it's applying to some multiple identities in upper triangular matrix. So we know exactly when that has a solution, right? An upper triangular matrix is invertible if and only if the diagonal entities are non zero. But we know the diagonal entities of a lambda one of R11 are, they're just lambda one. And from this, you're subtracting a number lambda, right? So this is the diagonal entries of this matrix. Lambda 1 is the diagonal entry of R11. Lambda is the one, the 1, 1 entry of R22. It's either lambda 2 or lambda 3, right? So lambda is either lambda 2 or lambda 3, because there are only two eigenvalues in R22. There's only two numbers that appear on the diagonal of R22. And we know that neither lambda 2 and lambda 3 is equal to lambda 1, so this matrix, this diagonal is non zero. Therefore, the matrix is invertible, right? So you can find the first column of x. So you can find the first column of x. We don't, know, we don't need to say what the solution is, but we can say it exists, and we can write it down, right? Now, once you know the first column of x, you can just find the second column of x by the same trick. Multiply both sides by R2, by E2. You have an equation that depends upon the first column of x and second column of x. The first column of x you already know, so take it to the left-hand side and solve for the second column of x. And you'll see that, again, the diagonal will look exactly like this. Right, so you keep doing this one column at a time. All right. So as long as the eigenvalues of R22 are not the eigenvalues of R11, this procedure will always succeed, and there'll be a unique solution, which also tells me that if I pick the right hand side to be zero, the only solution is the zero matrix. Right, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do with Jordan decomposition. Right, in the Jordan decomposition, we have exactly the same operator again. We're trying to solve A V minus J V is equal to zero. So we know this because we know the eigenvalues is maybe a finite number of j's we have to guess, an exponential number of them, no doubt, but a finite number of them. We know a, we want to find v so that a v minus j v is actually equal to zero, which means this linear operator could defi defined by a and v. What do I do? <laughs> I mean about that. So this linear operator defined by a and j is actually singular in this case. Right? That's exactly the case. We're not saying what to do over here. I'm not saying, oh, what happens if one of the eigenvalues of R22 matches the eigenvalues of R11? How do I know whether the right-hand side is in the range space of this operator? And if it is in the range space, how do I solve it? Yeah. Those things I'm not answering right now. But if you want to find the Jordan decomposition, that's the question you have to answer, the harder part of the question. Okay? 
you should got to keep this in mind. Okay, so you should always, of course, try it yourself. Do it in a different way. See whether you can answer this question without the way I do it. All right. Right, so now we know that there's an X. So since there's an X, I can always remove this thing. Right, and not only that, I can keep the R11 and R2 the same. And now the rest of the proof is by induction. Okay, so we're going to summarize. So therefore, given an upper triangle where you sequester the eigenvalues that are distinct in distinct blocks, you can come up with an immutable transformation that will remove all the octagonal blocks. Right? You cannot do anything to the diagonal blocks because we saw over here you cannot touch it by this method. The diagonal blocks will come through unscathed. Okay? So it will just be what they what you started with. It's just the odd diagonal blocks you get over here. All right. Right? So in principle, you don't have to do any calculation. You can just erase them with your hand. Right? So this is a vacuous thing. Unless you want to know what the transformation was. If you want to know what the W is, of course, you have to compute it. But if you only want the final di diagonal form, then you, know, you don't need to compute anything. You just erase it. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so far, so good. Okay, so we introduce a whole bunch of zeros now. So we, to summarize, at this stage, we are saying that given any matrix A, then there is a transform, let's call it W again. So it's a transform a linear ma a matrix W. So it's W means A. W can be written as R11, R22, R33, like that. Everything. And each R is an upper triangular matrix with a single number on the main diagonal. And lambda R is not equal to that. That's what we have so far. Right? So to summarize, this is how far I've gotten. Remember, this is a long path. First, we find this polynomial to produce zeros, then you do surety composition, then you have to sort the surety composition by some strange two by two transformations, then you do bubble sort. Then we reduce this Sylvester equation and then eliminate all the octagonal blocks. So, all this process is here so far. Okay? All right. That's still not the Jordan form, right? Because you see, none of these diag blocks are bi diagonal again. They're just full upper triangle matrices. But as the Jordan becomes this, you can introduce even more zeros inside those matrices. So now the next stage is to work on each, the proof is again by induction that for the next stage, we work on each diagonal block independently now, and then pull them all out. Okay, so we just have to only look at one diagonal block and say what you do. Okay, so now we say, okay, let's look at a single diagonal block that we have, take any one of them. They all look the same, so let's just call it R. So there's a lambda on, on this diagonal, and something on the top and zero to the bottom. Okay, and I want to take this diagonal block and write the job completion for this, right? So for, I'm, I want to prove that for this, I can find a matrix B such that when I look at the diagonal, it will have only lambdas and ones and zeros on it, like that. So that's the next stage and the final stage of the proof. With that, we'll be done. So then we can do that to each of these diagonal blocks and then pull all the V's out. Okay, so I'll leave those minor calculations to you. So we just need to concentrate on this one diagonal block and show how you can write it in the Jordan decomposition for this one diagonal block. All right, so this is the core part of the Jordan decomposition. You have to first realize that to compute the Jordan decomposition of a general matrix, you might be able to compute the Jordan decomposition. This is very, very, very special matrix. Right? This special matrix has only one eigenvalue, lambda. You see, n by n, but there's only one eigenvalue number. No other complex number that you could subtract from the diagonal to make it become singular. Right? This should be very obvious now. All right. right? So, the, so this is the case. Okay, so this is called the core case of the Jordan decomposition. And this is the one that we must crack. Okay, so now we come full-fledged into what we want. So the question is, what is the meaning of these Vs? Right? One would suspect that these are the eigenvectors. So, so well, if I know the eigenvectors of this matrix, maybe I can find those V, and you will be partially right if you start of that. So let's write it out. If I call the columns of V, so this is the proof. So if I, call, if I do my usual thing and call the columns of V, V1, V2 to Vn, then we see that from Rv is equal to Vj, that R times, let's write it out, okay? So I'm going to be a little bit careful. So I'm going to be a little bit more specific. Okay? I, need to, I need to be more, less cavalier about these ones and zeros because I need them in the calculation, right? I don't forget what they mean, so I'm going to be a little bit more uh, explicit about this. So to be a little bit more explicit about this, I'm going to define an, an extra notation. I'm going to define the matrix Z of N to be this shift up matrix that I talked about before. Okay, so not like that, and zeros everywhere else. So this is an N by N matrix, it's square. It's got zeros in the main diagonal and ones in the octagonal. 
right? So this plane of a triangle matrix is already in Jordan form. So this is called an elementary Jordan block, right? It satisfies the required properties. If it's upward triangle, you've got only ones and zeros in the first super diagonal, right? It has that property. Its eigenvalues are all zero, right? Because those are the numbers in the diagonal. It's only one eigenvalue, which is at zero. We'll see it has n copies of the zero. Okay, so this is called an elementary Jordan block, right? And this is the most important matrix in the subject. And this is also called the shift up matrix because we said if I apply to x1, x2 up to xn, and the result of this will be x2 to xn and then a zero. Right? So its action on a vector is trivial, it just shifts it up. So this is called a shift up. So sometimes people will denote it as z like that, with an up arrow. And z transpose will be the shift down matrix. Shift the only down by one integer. Okay? So this is in, and it's, it's hard to say exactly who picked up picked up the name Z first. I'm not sure who did it, but in electrical engineering, this is, makes sense because we we will in Z time we'll use Z and Z inverse to denote unit uh, delay and unit advance, right? In the Z transform domain, so for that, and of course also it's supposed to remind you of the complex number Z. Okay, so this may also behave like the complex number Z on top of that. So exactly what it is in the Z transform domain anyway. Right, so that's a, so deliberately that that notation was chosen to remind us of that complex number z, and you'll see that it actually behaves like a complex variable z to in the expressions that we create. Right. So <coughs> this matrix, of course, is important. So with this matrix, we can now give a more explicit representation of the Jordan form. So what we're going to say is that in the Jordan form for R, this matrix J will be will look like this. Okay. So it'll have Lambda plus some z n one, lambda plus z n two, lambda plus z n three, like that. Okay, it look like this. Or more explicitly, if I write it out, what I'm saying is that this matrix J will look like this. It'll be an n by one, n one by n one matrix up here, then an n two by n two matrix up here, like that. Then n three by n three, and so on. Let's say if I look at the first block. There will just be lambda in the main diagonal and just once, no zeros. Okay, when I run to the first zero, I peel off and create the next block. Again, I get lambda in the main diagonal and just once in the second diagonal. As soon as I hit the second zero, I peel off and start the third block. I have lambda in the main diagonal and just once in the diagonal. Okay, so every time I get a zero, I, I cut it. That's what I do. All right. So if I have two zeros in the main diagonal, I have three blocks. Okay. So once I do that, then I look at the size of each of these blocks. For so each of these blocks, I know that there's a Z matrix that will describe it, right? Because there'll just be one from the top. And then I have a lambda, so I put it as lambda i plus z. Okay. So that's the notation people use. And the reason, of course, writing it like that is to remind us of polynomials, right? So this like, looks like a linear polynomial, right? It looks like a plus bx. Or in complex variables a plus b z. Reminds us of that. So a is lambda, b is one in this case. All right. right, and that's the whole. This whole thing is very, very dependent upon the fact that humans feel comfortable with polynomials. Okay, the whole notation is geared towards that. We'll see as we go along. All right, so we have that. So with this, now we can state the the, the meaning of the decomposition. So if I write it all out, <coughs> okay. So if I write this all out, then my, let's take a specific example. Let's say that for this particular R, I must end up with a Jordan form that is lambda plus a lambda i plus a z3, lambda i plus z2, and lambda i plus z3 again. So let's say that's the example, for example. Right? You have to look at lots and lots of examples to sort of wrap your mind around what these numbers are going to mean. And once you understand what these numbers are actually doing, you will figure out how to compute them. Okay? So we we'll look at examples and examples and examples. So if I write this all out in gory detail, it looks like this. Three lambdas, two ones, two lambdas, one one, three lambdas, and two ones. Okay? That's the block partition. So three, two, three, three, two, three. That's how we have it. Right? So when we look at the corresponding W or the V, Right, I'm going to partition in conformance with this, okay? Because it's not a diagonal matrix, but it's block diagonal. So it's telling me I should look at V in the same way too. So when I partition V, I'm going to partition to three blocks: V1, V2, and V3. I put three columns here, two columns here, three columns here. All right. 
So when I write down R V is equal to V J, right? That's the joint decomposition in this case. So just for this particular example, then you see that I could look in this block form and I can look at R V one, V two, V three is equal to V one, V two, V three, and then I have this block diagonal lambda R plus Z three, lambda R plus Z two, and lambda I plus Z three again at the bottom. Like that, right? This looks like a three by three case. All right. So now we do the same thing. But see, the only change between this and the LU and the Q1 is really that where they were able to do it column by column, everything. Okay. For the joint decomposition, we don't have the luxury. You cannot do this column by column. Okay. I've seen proofs that you go column by column; they're all wrong. You cannot do this column by column. Okay. You can see that the numbers are all entangled. There's no logical way to write this column by column. It gets a mess. I'll write it down soon. But at least at this stage, you see that you multiply R times V1, the first block column on the left, going to be V1 times lambda I plus V3. Okay? So look at the second block column, I have R V2, that's equal to V2 times lambda I plus V2. And R V3 is equal to V3 times lambda I plus V3. Right? So you see that V1, V2, and V3 satisfy the same equation. But with different sizes of the z on the side, because so it's not like a v is equal lambda v, where they all satisfy all eigenvalues and they satisfy the same equation. So we just have to kind of find all solutions of that equation. Here we don't have the luxury. They look like the same equation, except for this little annoying fact that there's some integers running around to the change from block to block. Okay, so unless we know what those integers are, we don't know what equation to solve. Okay, so somehow we must know what the size of these blocks are before we can even figure out how to compute these v's or even what they mean. All right, so to find out what these v's mean, let's dig a little bit further. Okay, before we do that, we're going to make one essential simplification, which is notice that this number lambda actually plays no role in this decomposition. Okay, so we look at this. So notice that if I can write, if I write r is equal to v j v inverse, then it also is the case that r minus lambda i to v j minus lambda i. Okay, multiply both sides and check. You see, it's an identity. Right. So therefore, you see that we might as well pick lambda to be zero. Okay, nothing changes if I subtract lambda from the diagonal of r before I start the calculation. Right. I end up with the same v and the same j. With the lambda subtracted out, so from now on we're going to assume that lambda is equal to zero. Okay, this will greatly simplify our calculation. So if I take lambda equal to zero, you see that everything simplifies quite a bit. All these lambdas go away. We have z1, z2, z3, right? And these also simplify quite a bit to z3, z2, and z3 like that. All right. So we generally can't because we know this lambda, so and we can just subtract them from the diagonal. It doesn't change the calculation we do. We have to only find the v's, right? And they remain the same whether you keep the lambdas or not. So this is the calculation we the expression we have to compute. All right. So far so good. All right. So we know something about the v's. We have to pay attention to the size of the z's that you have to compute. All right. So our goal is to find what the size of the z's are, and to do that is the hard part. Okay. So let's go back and look at just uh, the one little z block first and say something about them, and then we will jump into the actual calculation. So these z's, understanding what this matrix does is important, right? Because we're going to produce them, so we want to understand at least a few things about this matrix first. Right? Because there's z3, z2, z3, for example, right? So how do we know 3, 2, and 3? So we look at this guy first. So when you notice, when you look at this matrix first, we see that it's already in Gaussian relation form, and we see that there's both a zero row and a zero column, right, in that matrix. So we know straight away what the rank of this matrix is, right? Because you can see that there's an identity matrix sitting on the top right. So obviously these terms are linearly independent and these rows are linearly independent, right? Or you can say it's in row radius or column form. There's another way of saying it. So you can see that the rank of this matrix is one less. The so rank of Z n is equal to n minus one, right? Therefore, the dimensionality of this null space is one. So the dimensionality of the null space of Z n is one. And there's also the dimensionality of the null of its left null space. Okay, so it's got all right. And what are the eigenvalues of Z n? It's all zeros. So that also we know. So the only eigenvalues 
and so we got one eigenvalue zero. Right, so it's a natural question to ask what is the eigenvectors of this matrix, which is the same thing as asking what is in the null space of this matrix. Right, so what is in the null space of Vn? And remember, in this class, unlike what you would do in an abstract class or in a functional analysis class, we're going to operate equally from the left and the right. Okay, for us, W and W inverse are the same things for us. So we'll also ask, everything that I ask on the right, I also ask on the left. So I'm, I'm also interested in the left null space. So I also want to know what is the left null space of this matrix. All right. In this particular case, you know, it's in row radius echelon form. All these questions are very trivial to answer, right? You can just by eyeballing this say that the, the right null, null vector, for example, is E1, right? So we noted that Zn times E1 is equal to 0, which we can write as E1 times 0. So E1 is the right eigenvector. And notice that the dimension of the null space is 1, so there's only one eigenvector. Okay, so we say that this matrix is defective. It doesn't have enough eigenvectors to cover the whole uh, space of n. So we to find one eigenvector. Okay, so this is the root cause of the problem of the rest of the calculations too. What about the left null space? You see that the last row is 0. So we see that En transpose Zn is actually equal to 0. You can write it as 0 times E sub n transpose. So E sub n transpose is the left eigenvector. So E sub n is the left eigenvector of this matrix. Notice that the left eigenvector is not the same as the right eigenvector. There are two different vectors completely. Right? One goes 1, 0, 0, 0, the other one goes 0, 0, 0, 1. Right? Furthermore, notice that if you take the inner prop between the left and the right eigenvectors, it's actually 0. Not only are they different, they actually perpendicular each other. Okay, so this is the hallmark of a non trivial Jordan form. The left eigenvector and the right eigenvectors will exist, but they actually perpendicular to each other. All right, so you have to be careful about that. Most of the time, you don't expect this to happen. You expect left eigenvector and right not to behave so badly as this. But in this case, it does. All right, so those are the properties. Now, <coughs> so of course, you can ask, what is the Jordan decomposition of the Z matrix? And for Jordan decomposition for the Z matrix, of course, is just itself. So it is just, right? So as we go to this proof, okay, you have to ask yourself, the way to check if your proof is right is ask, or to derive the proof, that's what you want, is ask, if I apply my matrix, if I apply my proof technique to Z and to a proof, I need to and I need to V and V inverse. So that's what you have to ask. Right? So if we said, okay, I'm going to start my proof by computing eigenvectors, because that would be the natural instinct, then you see that the proof already fails. Why? We only found two eigenvectors, E1 and EN, right? One was right, one was left. Clearly, that cannot be used to fill out the matrix R in any way. Right? So anything that starts with eigenvectors is probably doomed to fail. And I want to say this, and I say this one more time. I've seen many proofs in the engineering textbook actually start the proof by computing eigenvectors for the joint form, right? Such so proofs, of course, are completely wrong. Okay, they seem like they're doing the right thing because, you know, you say, oh, yeah, these should be columns of eigenvectors, but they're not. In fact, there will not be enough eigenvectors, and that's the cause of the problem in the first place. And we'll see this as we go through the rest of the calculation. So then the question is, okay, if, if the columns of the identity matrix are not the eigenvectors, right? So therefore, the columns of V also will not be eigenvectors. So one has to ask, what do the other columns mean? And where do these other columns of identity come from? Because they don't come from this calculation for sure. Right? And the key thing is this. This is the right that, okay? So let's look at the, uh, the equation I erased. So you can also do in this case, okay? So we know for the first block column, right? This is what was the equation. So the first three columns of the matrix V. That's the view from the Jordan completion of R, right? It was a three by three Jordan block. So that was the equation we first wrote down. So I want to ask, what is the meaning of each of these three columns in V1? So let's look at it. So let's say that capital V1 at three columns, V1, V2, V3, then this looks like this, V1, V2, V3, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, right? That's Z3. Okay, let's look at it column by column. <coughs> what is R times V1? The first column on the left, the first column on the right is just 0, which I can pretend in my mind is V1 times 0, okay? We'll see that. It's not a terrible idea. What is the second column? Well, R times V2 is the second column on the left. On the right, it is just going to be 1 times V1. Which is a little bit strange, but we can look at that. It's nothing to do with V2, but you see, it depends on the previous column V1. And what about V3? If you look at this third column, R times V3, and the right is just V2. Okay, so I'm going to keep it like this. That's what I want. All right. 
So what can we say about V1? Well, clearly the first column is an eigenvector, right? Because the eigenvalue is zero, R times V1 is going to go to zero times V1. So this guy is an eigenvector. So V1 is an eigenvector. Yes. So we understand it, right? We could even compute it. So we at least produce the first column in the proof, which is one of the eigenvectors of R. What about V2? Well, oh, that should be easy, right? I mean, I have V1, so V2 should be R inverse V1. But notice that that flies in the face of what we're trying to do, right? Because what is R? R has got zeros in the diagonal. So it is clearly, I mean, it's very far from being invertible. Right? We set all the eigenvalues of R to be zero by subtracting lambda from the diagonal. That's how we ended up with that equation. So R is clearly not invertible. So even if I knew V1, how will I prove that exists a V2? Because R is not invertible. And notice that that compounds itself. Once I find V2, I have again to find V3 by inverting R, but R is not invertible. Right? So even if I know the eigenvectors, I have to struggle to find the rest of this chain. Okay, so most proofs in your textbook make this flaw. They assume that if you can find V1, that you can solve this for V2, and then you can solve this for V3 and so on, right? Of course, they just wave their hands, so the proof goes wrong in two ways. Either you'll end up with a chain that is too short, and you won't be able to construct, you won't get enough columns for the matrix V, or worse, remember there's another equation you have to solve too, right? For Z2, there's one more block. If you look at the next two columns of V, Remember, there are eight columns in V in our example. The next two columns of V satisfy this equation. Z2, so we have R times V3, V4 is equal to V3, V4, 0, 1, 0, 0. So I have R V3 is equal to 0, R V4 is equal to V3. Right? So I have to compute these guys too. Right? But that looks like exactly like the one you started with. So you get to do it one more time, you might end up with a shorter chain. And then you must show that if you put all these five columns together, well, sorry, V4, V5. V4, V5, V4, V4. Okay, V1, V2, V3, V4 from all these columns, you should get a linearly independent set of columns. Right? And if you look at all these proofs that are wrong, that go this way, they don't prove that. And why they don't prove it? Because it's wrong. If you try to actually calculate this, you'll, you'll go nowhere with, it, with the calculation. Okay, so you'll be careful. You cannot proceed the way that is most natural. Start from the eigenvectors and try to pick. So this sequence, sequence V1, V2, V3 is called a Jordan chain. So this is called a Jordan chain. This is called one Jordan chain. And this sequence, V2, V4, V5 is called another Jordan chain. And then of course, V6, V7, V8 is another Jordan chain. So this matrix, if you look at its answer, has three Jordan chains. One of length three, length two, and length three, and if you put them all together, from a linearly independent set, so, right? And the proof consists of finding these Jordan chains. Once you find the Jordan chains, you can stick them in the matrix V, and then you will get the decomposition, right? Because this equation is exactly the same as these equations, so that you'll be done, right? So we have to find these Jordan chains, and these Jordan chains are a nuisance because to find them, the most obvious calculation that you will do is find the eigenvector starting from there is useless, okay? You cannot proceed that way. We really, really convinced that okay, you should try to do it, take an example that I gave in the homework this time, and try to do it this way. Okay, compute the eigenvector, then try to back off going up into the Jordan chain. You'll see that you can do it. You can actually, using Gaussian machine techniques, you'll see that V1 is in the range space of this matrix, that you can actually find a V2. And if you do it just right, you might get lucky, and this V2 might actually be in the range space of R again. So if you're unlucky, of course, V2 will not be in the range space and you end up with the solution of this, but that's okay. Set that Jordan chain aside and try to find a new one. And you see it's very, very hard to get the full set to be linearly independent. Okay, so what is the right way to do the proof? Okay, the right way to do the proof is to go in the opposite direction. Okay, and that is the key thing. The right way to do the proof is to go in this direction, not with V1, but with V3. First find V3, then V2, and then V1. I have to then just multiply. If I know V3, then V3 is V. If I know V2, R times V3 is V1. How do I know the right answer? R times V1 should be 0. All right. So there is a constraint, but you apply it at the end, and you never have to invert the matrix R along the process. All right. So to find the right proof, we must find this part of the joint ticket, the last guy in the joint and then work our way up into this thing. And the question is, what is unique about V3? Right? What's so different about V3? How do I know I've got the right V3? 
All right. Whenever you get a question like this, go back to the example. Right? So we have exactly the same problem for this case too, right? I know the eigenvectors E1 and En, but what are the Jordan chains for Zn? Let's look at it. There's only one block, so there should be only one Jordan chain. So what are the Jordan chains? Let's write it out, right? So we can easily see in this case that Z times E1 is zero, right? Because the shift up matrix. Z times E2 is E1, Z times E3 is equal to E2, dot, 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 Z times En is En minus one, right? So this is the Jordan chain for Z, right, because it shifts up. All right, it's trivial to write it down. So how do I know that En is the start of this chain? If I do not actually see this Jordan decay already done, how do I know I should shift En? All right, so this is the crucial question, right? And the major, major mental block when you work with these decompositions and spectral theory in general is to realize that the question is not about just about the matrix A, it's also about matrix A squared and A cubed and A to the fourth and A to the fifth, and they give you different pieces of information. Okay, that is the most important mental block when you work with these proofs. So when you get stuck with A, you look at A squared instead. When you get stuck with A squared, look at A cubed instead. If you get stuck with all of them, look at the linear combinations. Okay, so this is just like, you know, when we get stuck, you know, we know only some few tricks like this one, and then A times U, U inverse, like that. So. So there's one more algebraic trick that the human mind has a hard time with, so you have to always consciously reach in your back pocket for this trick. I cannot come up with a good meaning for EN by looking at the matrix Z, so I look at Z squared. Then I look at Z cubed, then Z for eventually I come up with a triple meaning for E sub and then I know how the whole thing falls together. Okay, so what we're going to do now is to look at Z squared. Okay, so let's start. So let's start with Z, Z to the four, Z four, right? So there's a four by four Z. And look at what is spelled about this force squared. If you do the calculation in your head, just saying that it's a shift up matrix, you have to shift every column up. So you get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. That is nice. The, the, the ones on the diagonal went from, went from the first super diagonal to the second super diagonal. We just shift it up by one. Okay, that makes sense because Z4 squared should be shifted up by two positions. Right? So that's exactly what it should look like. What happens if we look at Z4 cube? If I look at Z4 cube and multiplying this by Z4, so I should push, push everything up by one position. If I push everything up by one position, I get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, there's Z4 cube. Notice that there's only one non zero in this number. It's in the top right corner. And then if I look at Z4 to the power of 4, I push everything up, all the columns up by one position again. So I'm applying by Z4 from the left to Z4 cube. You see the last one out of the field, and I get a zero matrix. And from now on, any higher part of Z4 will be zero two. Right, so this is a proof of what I'm going to state now. Right, it's obvious what I'm going to state now. It says if I look at the Zn, then it has this property. So Gn squared, we have zero from the main diagonal, zero from the second super diagonal, and one from the third, third super diagonal. If I look at the same as you times, if I look at Gn cubed, it will have zero from the main, zero from the first super diagonal, zero from the third super diagonal, and then one. Right. In every case, notice that the matrix is already in row that line, row with this at line. Right? The value pattern is already being done. So you can find its rank, you can find its null space, the left null space. Very, very easy, right? You can write it down. For example, for Z and squared, we see there are two zero columns and two zero rows. Right? For Z and two, there will be three zero columns and three zero rows. Right? Right, and it's clearly these columns and those are really independent. These columns and these are really independent. These are the kind of ones. So it's very, very easy to say everything about this matrix. Okay, so most importantly, notice what happens to the last power. Okay, if you look at the last power before it becomes zero, it is one less than n, right? So that is the one that matters to us. If you look at z sub n to the power n minus one, it will be zeros everywhere except in the last one by one And notice that in this position, you can see E sub n hanging around, right? The last guy in the Jordan chain for Z sub n is E n, right? And E n 
has a unique meaning for the glass matrix. So what, what is it called? Vn is such that v sub n for n minus 1 of v sub n is not equal to 0. Right? And if I multiply v n one more time, it will go to 0. Alright. So it's the very last guy in the power sequence that matters. Okay? So that tells me what the head of the joint chain is going to be. So any vector which is not in the null space of this matrix. Okay, E sub n is any vector that when you apply this guy is not good. Okay, so obviously in this case, you know, I could do because we have to work in the general R case, right? In the R case, we do what we have is. What are we going to do over there? Luckily, the whole thing carries over to R2. Right? So, so what we did in this example is not so algebraically pretty. But the same thing goes through for R, and it will give us a hint on how to find the top end, or if you want to call the bottom end of this jargon chain. So this vector is easy to compute. You do not have to solve for anything, you just have to guess it. Okay, so let's do the whole thing for R now. Okay, so we look at an example with different calculations. Sorry, a bit preposterous, but let's try it for R now. Okay, so when I look at the matrix R, remember it is. We already subtracted eigenvalue from the diagonal. So it got zeros on the main diagonal, and then it got something on the top right diagonal. It was called a strictly upper triangle matrix. Okay, so R in, R in the code problem is strictly upper triangle, and that is because we did some transformations so and made R having one eigenvalue on the diagonal, and then we decided that for the computation of this V, we don't even need that eigenvalue, we just subtracted from the diagonal. Right? So the V for both must be the same. So we raise the power lambda from the diagonal. So now the new eigenvalue of this new R is just zero. So we need to look at the zero eigenvalue is, is confusing to some sort because we said because zero can be an eigenvalue. Right? And it's an eigenvalue. And notice over here that we have a strange equation for so the nth power of a matrix is zero, but the n minus first power is not zero, and nothing before that is zero. Right? So in matrix algebra, you can actually factor, you can find the nth root of the zero matrix and it may not be zero. Right? This is very strange because in no other case like real numbers, complex numbers, whatever, you cannot take the nth root of zero, there's non zero number. Right? Here you can actually get it. You can actually factor the number zero in the smaller matrix. We've seen this before for non square case, but now in the square case, also this is important. Okay? So these matrices are given a name, right? So maybe it's said to be nil potent. So when talking about joint decomposition away from, you only talk about the nilpotent case. Everybody will assume you know what to do if it is not nilpotent. We can go to that massive calculation we did. Got a bunch of diagonal blocks. For these diagonal blocks of type is ideally, they'll automatically become nilpotent. Okay? So we, what we're going to show is that the may be nilpotent if for some power k it is zero. Right? And we notice that z is a nilpotent matrix, v sub n. The nilpotent matrix, but R is also nilpotent. Okay, so this guy, strictly upper triangle, which means it has to be nilpotent. And the thing goes like that. You take this matrix, you've got zero in the main diagonal, and you square it once, and you prove that if you square it, then the first super diagonal will have to be zero. So you don't know what about things in the top. So if you cube it, Then you have to prove that you can easily show that the first two super diagonals should be zero. Like that. Okay, the same thing that just said. So I go to it. It's not just shifting up, it's shifting up a bit in linear combination, but it does shift up too. Okay, so if R is strictly upper triangular, you can't tell what its rank is, you can't tell what its null space is easily. But what the one property that does survive is this new potential. So if you take a strictly upper triangle matrix that is four by four, so, if you take a strictly upper triangle matrix that is 4 by 4, and you take a fourth power, it's going to be 0. Okay? Of course, you know, because we did before that, if I take the 0 matrix, for example, its first power is 0. Okay, so let me talk about this. Huh? In the way polynomial algebra is done, it is better to define, unfortunately, the 0 power 0 by the matrix. Okay? So, so, for the 0 matrix, the first power is 0. Okay, so maybe it's going to be strictly upper triangle. And you know there is a bound on a new potency degree. This is the size of the matrix. If it's 100 by 100 matrix, we guarantee the part of 100 is going to be zero. But of course, it will become zero earlier. Okay? And it's this early part that we care about. Why? 
So let's go back to our example, right? So again, go back to the example and look at it again. So we know what happens for one z. What happens if r is the sum of two z's? Suppose in the final, we end up with z4 and z7. So suppose z is join the company of this particular r. Right? So let's look at it. If I look, if I look at r power k, then we know it will be v, z4, z7, and power k v in this, right? That's the whole point of this similarity transformation. You can move the power to the inside. Right? But this is a block diagram matrix, so we know that the block diagram matrix behaves like that in the system, so the power moves in time. Right? So we know in this case that it's enough to take k to be 7, and r stop 7 will be 0, right? So we see that r power 7 will be 0. Right? Because z to the power, this one in case 4 will be 0. But this one, the lower block will not be zero. And you can't depend upon these that they're then going to be anything zero. So you must make all of these zeros. So if you put k to seven, this will go to zero. Of course, you get a zero too. So the zero make it clear, so the whole thing will go to zero. Right? And the little bit of elbow grief, this is the fact that these zeros are invisible. You can check that r power six will not be zero. Right. So we look at the answer to guess how we should find this quadrant. To find the Jordan chain of similar sizes of Jordan graphs, so we must first get how to find the size of Jordan graph, and now finally we have an answer. Okay? So by looking at the proof and treating, by looking at the answer, we see that what matters is the smallest number that you can write down over there that makes R to the power k zero, and that will tell you the size of the Jordan graph. Is it? All right. So now we are almost ready to complete. Okay, so when you're doing this proof, so when you're doing this proof, I suggest you keep an example in your mind. Okay, so keep an example in your mind. The example I like is something like this, but it means it's more. So it goes Z3, Z3, Z5, and Z5. So keep an exciting example in your mind so that you don't confuse yourself. And also try to repeat the Jordan block size, like two copies of three, for example. Okay, if you think something too simple, you're very likely to put it around the wrong Right? So look at something sufficiently complicated, and then when people say we have a shadow proof, just apply to one of these examples and see that the shadow proof actually works. So you see more than the shadow proof is wrong. So, okay, so, so this is the example that we want, right? So this is R, so then we know that in this case, minimum degree is okay? So what we say here is the done. Okay, so now we've given enough examples. So we should just start converting your guesses into calculating and proving things. Okay? So let's start. So we say that let, let's select K be the smallest integer. Just that I found three to Okay? So that's the new potential degree of this matrix. Strictly upper term like actually new potent. So we know eventually R to the power something will go to zero. You find the first instance where R to go to zero. Always keep in mind that R could be the zero matrix. Okay, so be careful about it. Make sure that you keep working the edge cases. If R is the zero matrix, then of course K will be one, not zero. Be careful about that. Right. So then we know that the Jordan chain is given from this part. So our guess is that our Jordan chain should be constructed from the last power which was not zero. Right, so we say okay. So look at look at R for K minus one. By definition, that is not a zero matrix. Right? So if K is equal to one, then we're saying R for zero one is zero one. That's a test, right? So we define R for zero by any matrix. All right. So in even in the edge case, the statement is correct. So R for K minus one is not equal to zero. All right. So therefore, since there's some non-zero entry in the matrix. There is some vector W such that this is equal to zero, so W is equal to zero. All right. So you can find W. So this is the bottom of the majority. Notice that no calculation is required. Right? Other than maybe special equation. You do have to find this mean potential degree of this matrix. If you cannot find this mean potential degree, I hope you realize by now that any proof that does not depend upon this is somehow just blatantly wrong. Okay? And if you convince yourself that without knowing this degree, you can't at least finagle the Jordan chain back. Unless you're lucky and you just guess the right solution. Okay? You can't produce a proof by guessing, of course. 
Okay, so this is the guy, this is the one that starts with writing from, right? And you can do any W, right? So for example, if I take article K minus one C, there's a pen sitting over here in the fifth column, I can just take E5, and that will be on there. Right? I just took out the fifth column, there will be nine zero number over there, and I'm done. All right, so it's easy, right? You can easily find a W to satisfy this picture. You can solve it in a picture. All right? So now, once, so you know the bottom of this guy, then this thing tells me form the full garden chain, right? How do I form the full garden chain now? So I'm saying, okay, I start with W, right? I'm starting with EN. To get the next guy in the garden chain, I should multiply by Z, the next guy in the garden chain to the R times W. Right? That's why I would look at my example and that's what I should do. And the next guy should be R times this guy, so R squared times W, R T times W. You see, we're getting our old frame back. R T minus one W. Right, and then of course my temptation is to find R to K W, but this is to the zero step. So you see, we're getting a trilog sequence back. So of course, this is again a trilog sequence, right? So this is a trilog sequence again. So in these kind of computations, this guy will just keep showing up again, right? Okay, so numerically, you never find the sequence. So unless the matrix R is you know, a thousand matrix or something like a unitary matrix, this trilog sequence is unstable. Okay, so numerically, it has no meaning. So you, if you depend upon computing this guy and doing QR factorization and all, you get just nine things after a while. In a typical example, you know, if K runs into the tens or the twenties, already you're doing numerical check. So I'm just saying that because I see dynamic systems which are always simulating like this. Okay, so you can't compute this, you can't simulate ODEs or initial value pairing values or numerical okay? It makes no sense. They're all just unstable methods. Unless your, your ODE is unitarily invariant, you cannot simulate it. Right? Just like if I say it, you never want to look at a spice plot. Now, it makes you feel happy when you plot in spice into a certain graph, but it will not be anything like that at all. Right? From an engineering point of view, simulations of time are useful because of this property. So we'll see more about this as we go through. You can simulate equilibrium phenomena, but not trans in phenomena in the matter. All right. So this is a kind of sequence that will appear in lots of calculations, but again, like Laplace transform to be a point. So what do we do with this? Well, this tells us what the first two columns of the V matrix are. Right? So we, from the sequence, we know, well, I should put the kind of sequence in there, and I should put it in the reverse order, right? Because in V, I should go E1, E2, not E1, like that. Right? So I know I should put this in reverse order. So I should put I power 2 into W, I power 2 minus W, like that, as columns of the W matrix, but I'm not going to get enough of this color sequence, right? Why? Because notice that if I look at my matrix R, for example, it's got Z4 and Z7, right? If I look at Z power 6, I'll pick E sub N as my W, but I only produce the same corresponding to Z7. So I only produce 7 columns before I come to the 0. So right? that's I need 11 columns to get a square matrix V out of it. So I'm really going to produce 7 columns, not 11 columns in that case. Right? So when I stop over here, I do not have the V matrix. Right? That makes sense. I only found one Jordan chain, but two Jordan chains in that example. So this is not a square matrix that I have. All right. If we successfully guess, not to the proof, to show that I'm successfully guess, I must prove that this, of course, will actually form a V matrix. I'm not yet there. But I, I see still that my proof has a problem now, right? V has to be a square matrix and nowhere close to being square. I produce a passage, I put in one Jordan chain. I have to prove that, I've not yet done it. But it is not enough to form the V matrix. Okay, so what do I do now? So there are many styles of proof at this point. Okay, the traditional proof is to go from the right hand side, which is to say that, well, these Vs are the right Jordan chains, right? They're still on the right of the matrix V or X. So I should finish finding these guys. Find the next Jordan chain, the next Jordan chain, the next Jordan chain. Keep going until you get enough to get a basis for your vector space, or in this case. So this case, you need to find 11 of these guys before you're done. But, and the reason for doing it from the right is that it works better than infinite dimension setting. Okay? But in this class, we are in a finite dimension setting. It's actually easier to go back and find the left job in terms of Okay, so the way I'm going to do the rest of the proof is like this. So I'm trying to guess what my B is, right? So I'm trying to say, well, okay, here's my example. Okay, so my goal is to come to this decomposition. B, B4, A, B7, B9, right? What I've 
part is the V five point to V seven. So I got P of the V. I don't have I don't have this guy. I think that is V seven here, something over here. And I need to get V in what? Right, this is what I want to get. Right, the normal style of the proof is to finish filling up this guy, but finding the garden proof corresponding to V4. But that is kind of a little bit tricky to do, so I will not do it that way. What I'll do is I will just complete the matrix. So what do I do on V1? I will do on the rows of the inverse and I'll find the row, the first seven rows of the inverse and the left garden proof. But I'm looking at the transport of this matrix. Okay, I'm doing it in a lower time in the I'll do that again in my class, but I find the left garden thing. Once I do that, then I will say, fill in these numbers, I get this many is the inverse of that Because it's a major completion problem, it's very, very common in engineering. You have a partial measurement, you can't measure the rest. You can fill in the rest of the measurement such that it makes it something better. Okay? So I'm just saying, fill in these numbers, just the language where you feel like there are millions of solutions, find one, such that this becomes invertible, so this is the inverse of this guy, and then you see that actually it's interesting. Okay, so the rest of the calculation is this, find the left joint chain exactly the way we did the right joint chain, but such that WH, V1, is scientific to right? This has to be the inverse of this guy. So it's the dual basis of this guy. That's the solid part of the question. The V inverse, V is scientific method. So you need to find a left garden chain, but not really nilly. It must match the right garden chain. And by matching, we mean that it must satisfy the function. So some of the things we do. Once you do that, we say just really nilly fill these numbers up here and here. So I said this matrix is the inverse of that matrix. So we do a major compression problem. And then we just multiply and calculate this problem. Okay, this is the last two stages of the proof, and then we'll be done. So again, just go to the notes. So we can hear me talk in the next class, it's easy to follow. All right, good luck.